I'll uh, quote one of my former law professors, Justice Bernard S. Jefferson, who wrote the bench book on evidence, by the way, Alonzo, who once said, I'll be as brief as I can, no matter how long it takes. <laughs> Just kidding. When I was three years old, I looked across the street, and the neighbor was getting a paper thrown to his home. I went inside and begged my father to give me a Los Angeles Times paper subscription. I became fascinated with the news, fascinated with everything that was in it, and he got me that subscription. And for the past 65 years, I've been a subscriber to the Los Angeles Times and many other papers. My father was an avid reader, as was my mother, and uh, I'm an anomaly because as a kid of the 60s, uh, you know, uh, both of my parents were college educated. And as an African-American, that was rare. But I was fortunate and privileged to have two well-educated uh, parents who encouraged me to do and be anything I wanted to be. So I wanted to be an astronomer. So I studied everything that I could see and look towards, learned all of the stars in the sky and all of the planets, the constellations, et cetera, et cetera. Fast forwarding, I went through uh, grade school and high school and you know, succeeded quite well. In fact, I see another Compton Centennial High School former student in the back stand who called my name out in Harvard Square today. But, and I invited him here, so thanks for coming, Stan. And his daughter, and his daughter uh, is here, uh, a student at Harvard as well. So at any rate, uh, I got an academic athletic scholarship to Willamette University, which is one of the fine uh, Ivy League universities of the Northwest. And uh, there were nine African-American students there. In fact, we brought Julian Bond there uh, while, uh, while I was there. A tragic accident took me back to Los Angeles. And I knew I wanted to study radio, television, and film then after studying astronomy at Willamette. So I majored in radio, television, and film, worked at every radio station. I could press my nose against the glass to every television station, everything. Back in those, back in those days, WHUR radio was the number one station in the country in its style and format. It created the Quiet Storm format. It created a number of folks who've gone on to do tremendous things in radio. So I worked there, a show that still runs to this day some 45 years later called The Daily Drum that combined news, music, and information. And I was one of those founding uh, announcers, if you will, at HUR Radio on the campus of Howard University where Catherine Graham gave a 50,000-foot tower and that's how that radio station you know, flourished, if you will. So after working for HUR for some time, I did a thousand voiceovers. I was the ABC Movie of the Week guy for television and radio and did a thousand voiceovers for just about every major concern. Picked up a residual check one day and the guy said, hey, you ever be a print model? I said, no, I didn't think I could. Well, go see Mr. Diamond. Went to see Mr. Diamond. Before you knew it, I was all over the Washington Post all over every newspaper and billboard in Washington. So after a myriad of commercials and television uh, appearances and shows, and uh, you know I was on every station in Washington, I said, well, if you can make it here, you got to go where? Got to go to New York. So I went to New York, and fortunately, I became the working most commercial actor in my category in America. I made about 300 national commercials. Amway, Amtrak, Dean Witter, Hartford Insurance, Kodak, Polaroid, uh, Millionaire Cologne for Menon, Wrigley's Jello, you name it. I did it. I was a billboard guy for Seagram's, VO, Newport, Salem, Norelco. I did it. So I had that wonderful experience. But it pays off later because it taught me what product endorsement was about. Not only did Lee Steinberg represent some of the finest athletes in the world, he was uh, 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 his uh, client's roommate, which is all the experience he had at the time. But I was different and distinguished from that because I had been, you know, the commercial actor, the print model. I knew how product endorsement worked. I knew how to sell, you know, the wife in Pocatello, Idaho, a sack of potatoes, right? I understood it. So I felt I could transform and give that 
to my clients who wanted to make the tra a transition and crossover into uh, uh, product endorsement. Fast forwarding, after all the stuff in New York, a television series brought me back to California, Counterattack, Crime in America with George Kennedy, came on opposite 60 Minutes on ABC. So for 10, 12 minutes every Sunday night, I was featured, George Kennedy would throw it to me, I'd represent or tell a story about the 45 caliber thief in New York or the pizza kitchen bandit in Colorado, whatever the story. After six weeks, that series was gone. A lot of episodic work thereafter. Hardcastle and McCormick, Greatest American Hero. I did 15 episodes of Matlock, which is a courtroom drama. I was the regular courtroom bailiff in that. It still runs to this day. But then I decided law school is something I always wanted to do. And so I took myself to night law school. And even though you have to stay four years once you start, start part-time, I finished in three and a half. I finished law school, went to Indiana because the bar was before I got out of law school, passed the bar, said that's all I need. And I can be <coughs> and go anywhere uh, in the world at this point. Fortunately, I, I do have a California partner. I do, I've tried about seven cases in seven different states in, 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 in America to great uh, renown and interest, uh, I'd like to say, and I'll get to them very quickly. So at any rate, I cut my teeth on free agents. Anybody who said they could run, catch, or, or jump, I represented them, wound up paying more rent bill than, than, uh, than they earned me commissions. But nonetheless, I realized that there were more agents than athletes. So I said, what can I do to distinguish myself from all the other agents? So I created the first Michael Jordan Celebrity Golf Classic, and I sold it to television. I brought in everybody from Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Dr. J, everybody you can imagine, 40 of those, and held it in a very prestigious place. That got good to me. So we created World's Fastest Athlete for ABC's Wide World of Sports with uh, Westchester County's Jim Spence, <coughs> who was the head of ABC Sports for 25 years. We did sports greats one-on-one -on -one with David Hartman with Jack O'Hara. Unfortunately, Jack O'Hara went down in the TWA flight uh, 200, I forget the number on it, uh, from New York to Paris. But we did the deal for sports greats with Jack uh, just before that. Uh, then we did uh, events for Milton Berle. Uh, just fantastic stories galore with that alone. Frank, they don't know Milton Berle. No, they don't, because most of them weren't I born. Do. Even the professors might not have been I born. Do. <laughs> but nonetheless, just a, 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 a story of all of the Hollywood glitz and glamour that you can imagine. And for a kid from the fertile, athletic, rich city of Compton, California, my appreciation stretches as wide as I can extend my arms because I thank my parents for taking uh, the covers off of my crucible and allowing me to think and imagine and grow and become whatever I wanted to become. Real fast, Bill, I'll tell this last one. So onward and forward, I went on to represent several mayors, senators, uh, city council persons. I became the television spokesperson for the city of Compton, so every night, I was one of the finalists for Dateline. So when Dateline didn't happen, I said, doggone, maybe I have to just go be a beat reporter in Los Angeles, which I did not want to do because I had been trained at NBC at the network level. So I understood the network side. I did my, my uh, I studied under, under the tutelage of John Chancellor, David Brinkley, Barbara Walters, all of them at NBC. So a local job was, was a little less than I wanted. But I was going to do it because it was a time when I needed to. Well, the mayor of Compton, the illustrious Omar Bradley, said, Frank, why don't you come to Compton? I'll let you run all the city departments, 14 city departments. You can be the spokesman for the mayor, city council, fire chief, police captain. I said, no, it's a blessing or a curse. Lo and behold, I was on television every single night because there was some sort of crime or other going on in Compton. 
I knew all the journalists. They loved the fact that I could give them, if they wanted a 30-second sound bite, I could give them 29.5 seconds <laughs> on time, full story, full, fully described of whatever the subject matter was. So that went super well. After I left the city of Compton, never looked back at the political structure there, I got a call from an interesting friend of mine who said, they've been to all sorts of lawyers, but they can't find a lawyer. So the little old lady came to me, and her family came to me. And it turns out that they said, our grandfather is somebody very famous. Our grandfather is the late Senator Strom Thurmond who was a staunch segregationist from the South, who had spewed venomous language for many years. We don't want Negroes in our churches, in our swimming pools, in our cars. But nobody knew behind the scenes that he had taken care of a lady by the name of Essie Mae Washington Williams, who was born in 1925, sired by Strom to his butler, his maid, I should say, because her name was Carrie Butler. The story has not been told yet, but we have delivered a New York Times bestseller called Dear Senator about Essie Mae Washington Williams, written by a very prestigious writer, William Stadium. That story was on a thousand newspapers around the world, New York Times bestseller for several weeks. Uh, movies wanted to be made and still may be made. So that's another story unto itself, and we'll get into that later. But the last thing, for the last couple of years, I've been one of the lead counsel for the Prince Rogers Nelson estate. So I had the good fortune of representing uh, several of the heirs uh, of Prince. Of course, one that just recently passed uh, was my specific client. But uh, I'd like to uh, proudly share with you that my thumbprint is on all of the six posthumous contracts that were signed by Prince that were worth about $100 million since his death. Uh, so I've had a very, very fascinating and wonderful career. But in addition to the Carl Lewis, Eric Dickerson, Ron Brown, Daryl Green, Jackie Joyner, Kersey, Al Joyner, Flo Joe, <laughs> uh, Magic Johnson, James Worthy, Byron Scott, and all of them, Dr. Edwin Moses, I've represented Bob for the past 30 years, <laughs> without whom I would never have been able to visit kings and queens, travel far and near, countries that I perhaps couldn't pronounce. And for that, I share with him personally and I share with you publicly, <coughs> I would give back every nickel of every dollar that I've ever earned from Bob Beeman in exchange for the experiences that I've shared and enjoyed. I'm going to take that commission back now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's an all a true story, and uh, it's, it's really been that rich, whether in Doha or Saudi Arabia or with the Queen of England. It matters not. It's all very fascinating. And what I do as a lawyer, a lot of you here may be interested in sports, entertainment, or you may be interested in real lawyer work. And uh, surely, you know, we have uh, uh, important work in negotiating the contracts I'm teasing because sometimes they tease us and call us the fancy lawyers. But I admire what the real lawyers do uh, with the hard work that they do, and that's why we try to take the influence of entertainers or athletes, and we try to marry them with organizations that have meaning so that it puts meaning into their lives. And when you transcend the sport I advocate for my clients, then you become truly an important sports figure who happens to have and humanitarian dimension, as does Bob. And I've encouraged Venus and Serena to do the same thing. When you put meaning, more meaning into everything that you do, more meaning in eating, loving, and living, there becomes more meaning in you. And Bob's work with Special Olympics, and trust me, he's endorsed every single major sponsor 
of the International Olympic Committee as well as the United States Olympic Committee. Bob has received every single major highest award given by the IOC, the USOC, and ANOC, the ANOC, Association of National Olympic Committees. The Olympian Award is only given away, is given away only uh, every 25 years. In 1994, four athletes received the Olympian Award aboard the Royal uh, Caribbean cruise ships. Fortunately, I represented two of those four. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of shows you how it works, right? You advocate for your client. But uh, the point is that Michael Ruzioni, Donna Di Verona, and of course, Flo Jo and Bob Beeman received the Olympian Award, which is given only uh, every 25 years. So our job, or at least I think that my job as an effective sports entertainment attorney, above and beyond looking at the, the, the plethora of experience I've been able to, to enjoy, is to marry Bob Beeman, whose humanitarian spirit and soul is natural, to place him with some something like what Angela has described in Special Olympics so that his meaningful uh, contributions can really be seen and appreciated. Most people won't say this, and typically whenever I tell Bob Beeman's story, I get choked up. Why? Because this is a man sitting next to me that was orphaned at 10 months old. And he spent his whole life after his athletic competitions, giving to kids, giving to people around the world. I've executive produced 12 of his celebrity golf tournaments that hosted everybody from Muhammad Ali to Dan Marino to every Olympian you could imagine. And he's raised millions for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. People don't know this. So before I completely break down and cry, Angela, I just wanted you to know that this is the greatness and the presence in which all of us sit. Now I'm gonna acknowledge one of my clients. I just got a chance to meet him in person this trip, but he comes out of MIT, he comes out of very uh, prestigious uh, educational background, but more importantly, he was referred to me, and I met him. And when I read and experienced his writings, I promise you, take a look at Ed Gaskins here. He's going to be just a screenwriter extraordinaire uh, at the highest level. So, Ed, thank you for coming. <laughs>